this is going to be a video response to Seven Hunted. You get a chance to check out his channel, and I will put a link to his channel below. He asked me in a comment quite a few videos ago about how I got my love of science. And I think there were two basic things when I was a young kid that I really think had the biggest influence. And maybe perhaps even without them, I still would have loved science anyway. It was probably just part of my nature and the way my curiosity was. But having a dad in the aerospace engineering field and working in the space program had a lot to do with it. And also, I like to read science fiction books. And then from science fiction books, I started latching on some science books. And they were from science fiction to science, I stayed with the same author, which I still think is the best overall science and science fiction author ever. He's no longer with us. That's Isaac Asimov, the guy that wrote the science classic iRobot, and a whole bunch of robotic, artificial intelligence type of books. But he also was a great science writer. He could, uh, teach himself any kind of science and mathematics, anything like that, and then just start writing about it. But the thing I liked most, and I like to do it myself when I get involved with talking to people about science, is he wrote it at a level that your average person can understand. He didn't believe in this uh, science was just uh, geek lingo. I hate that when these places make it like it's uh, technology or computers or anything like that is just for this uh, elite group in the know and not for everyday people. So I probably have read almost every book Isaac Asimov ever produced, whether it be science fiction or science. And then I started doing hands-on stuff. I actually built my own lab. I started building it about, uh, let's see, I think it was about 10 years old when I started building it. And having a dad that is in the aerospace industry really helped a lot because I could basically ask him for supplies and he could end up snagging them for me. Back at the time, my dad was working in the industry. There were not a lot of regulations and stuff like that. So if you, uh, we're in the upper levels to where you were actually ordering supplies from different suppliers, whether they be um, chemicals or things like that. You could just ask them for stuff and they would send it to you. So if I needed something for my lab, I'd just ask my dad about it. I'd say, well, um, how about a, a vacuum chamber? And by golly, my dad would give me a vacuum chamber. And then uh, I wanted to... Uh, about a pound of potassium nitrate. He got me a five pound jug of potassium nitrate. And if anybody knows about that, yeah, I was uh, making my own homemade gum powder. One of the kids in my junior high actually didn't believe I was, I was able to make my own gunpowder, so I made about a quarter of an ounce and uh, brought it to school and he took it home and lit it. And he's like, holy cow, that stuff really lit off. I didn't make it to where it would explode. I made it to where it would just kind of flash. I didn't make it to the kind of strength to where it would be. Well, I shouldn't say where it wouldn't be dangerous because any, any way you make it, it is dangerous. But I made it so it wasn't, it was flashing rather than explosive. And uh, he was rather impressed. Nowadays doing that kind of stuff, oh man, I would probably be branded a terrorist. And uh, especially because the fact that I actually brought it to school and showed him. Back at the time, things were a lot more lax than they are right now. But... Yeah, it used to be a lot easier to do dangerous stuff. I, uh, I was able to get a hold of high concentrated acids. I had highly concentrated hydrochloric acid, uh, sulfuric acid, I think nitric acid too. Um, I thought about the possibility when I was about 11 
of making nitroglycerin, but I could not think of any way to make it stable. And at least the publications I read at the library about it at times, um, there was basically no way when you first created it, you could create it in a stable enough form to where I wouldn't end up blowing up my house. I still can't figure to this day how my dad didn't know with me uh, asking for all this different stuff. I mean, he obviously, uh, being a top aerospace engineer, kind of knew what some of this stuff could be used for. I guess he just trusted my better judgment, which I don't know, with a 10 or 11 year old, should you really do something like that? <laughs> But yeah, I basically had access to stuff to uh, experiment and do what I wanted. I The biggest explosion I ever had in my lab was when I just purposely lit a test tube full of hydrogen that I'd manufactured myself on fire and it made a little whoosh. But uh, at least I had a sense enough for safety to not produce anything that was going to blow up the house. So I guess it all came out for the good. I remember a friend of my dad's that was a plastics engineer, I think he was. He said he did the same thing too. He set up his own lab when he was a kid. But what his lab did was he wanted to uh, he wanted to counterfeit currency, but not paper money. He wanted to counterfeit um, coins. And he set up. He he showed me how he did it. He had these. Uh, he electroplated, he used, um, oh, it's, it's really hard to explain, but basically what he did was he made non-conductive material into molds, and then he plated the molds, and then he could actually make quarters that could pass as real. And I don't know whether he, he I never actually saw one of them because he was an adult by this time, and he wasn't a kid, so... But he claimed that they did pass off for real, and he's smart enough, he probably is, it probably is true that he could actually produce quarters by a, a combination of uh, working with some kind of metal discs and plating. And I asked him, I said, well, how much actually do you think it cost you to produce them? And he said, well, he actually did cost it out, and each one of the quarters, the fake quarters that he produced, cost him 50 cents to produce. So I said, well, that probably wasn't such a good money-making scheme then, was it? And he's like, nah, I gave it up right away. <laughs> so, yeah, my advice to you is if you're uh, setting up a plating lab to produce fake quarters and it costs you 50 cents a piece to produce the fake quarters, you're not going to make the money even in volume. Yeah, they're saying nowadays it's, uh, things are just too safe and uh, kids don't have a chance to have fun and take a chance, but boy, thinking about it now, would I ever, ever in my wildest dream let one of my children do some of the stuff that I did when I was a kid? No way. No way.